Millennials are often saddled with the reputation of being self-centered and lazy. I didn't write that. So don't it's at me. Sad, don't Bay. at me. I know. <laughs> but the generation <laughs> is bucking that trend by setting their sights on the government. The ones we've been waiting for. How a new generation of leaders will transform America is a book that explores the childhood experiences that shape millennials and their views on U.S. politics. It follows the rise of several millennials in government, from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Elise Stefanik. Stefanik, rather. Stefanik. Stefanik. Mm -hmm. And uh, gives some insight into what the future of, of government might look like. So joining us now with more on this is the author and Time Magazine national correspondent, Charlotte Alter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for and having Pete me. And Pete Buttigieg, too, right? Yeah. He's Buttigieg, probably one yeah. of the more, more famous ones. So let's talk about some of the major sort of life and national events that shape the way millennials view government. Yeah, so my book starts on 9-11 because that was truly one of the single most formative experiences for people of this mm -hmm. generation. And then it traces them through the wars that followed, which dramatically shaped how millennials thought about American intervention abroad right. and the value of that and the benefits and drawbacks of that, uh, through the financial crisis, which absolutely affected their attitudes about the economy and their own financial state as well, uh, through the election of Barack Obama and the social movements that flourished during his presidency, like Occupy and Black Lives Matter, then, then into the, the election of Donald Trump, which led a lot of these young people, uh, particularly the ones who just got elected to Congress in the last cycle, mm -hmm. to think, hey, listen, if this guy could do it, maybe actually being in your early 30s is not a disqualifying characteristic for being in elected office. Right. And so, so who are some of the millennial leaders you highlight in the book? So it... So I was focusing specifically on elected leaders who were born between 1980 and 1996. So I include Pete Buttigieg, who I've been interviewing for this book since 2017, mm -hmm. long before he was running for president, AOC, and I found some of her uh, personal Facebook videos from her trip to Standing Rock, which really shows a lot of her political evolution, mm -hmm. uh, Lauren Underwood and Haley Stevens and Max Rose, some of the young Democrats who flipped seats in Congress last cycle, and Republicans like Elise Stefanik from upstate New York, Dan Crenshaw from Texas, and Carlos Curbelo from Florida, who really illustrate how uh, young Republicans have responded to many of these same forces. And you also sort of focus on the way millennials were raised, mm -hmm. right? Because, like, this is the era now where there, there's all this pop psychology and there are books about how to raise kids and there's helicopter moms and there's all this stuff. And I think they were they have been raised differently than previous generations, probably than our generation. Right. right. Yeah. So uh, the second chapter of the book mm -hmm. is called Harry Potter and the Spawn of the Boomers. <laughs> and it's, it's very much about how boomer parenting was just radically different than anything that had come before it. The baby boomers were the most intensive generation of parents in history. They spent radically more time with their kids. They were much more involved and much more aware of things like enrichment activities and making sure kids listened to music. Right. Um, they, uh, women at, baby boomer women were much more likely to have a college education than their mothers did, which meant that millennials were the first generation to be more likely than not to have two college educated parents. That made a huge difference. Um, but also there were just big uh, new trends in attitudes around what was good for kids and what was bad for kids. So millennial childhood was the first time that you, that people really thought of bullying as something that was a, a problem instead mm -hmm. of something that was just part of childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, Charlotte, because um, two things that come to mind. One is that the younger boomers, in other words, like there's probably two segments of boomers, right? Those yeah. who are yeah. our parents who had uh, children in the 60s and then those who had children in the 80s, which that does sound more of like those parents because yeah. my family it was like, I was in the generation where you have to go out and cut your own switch kind, <laughs> yes. uh, kind of uh, generation. But, you know, what I find really fascinating about this is um, there's always been a, 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 some scrutiny of young leaders. And I wonder if some of the qualities that you found in interviewing these subjects are any different than those you would have found in the generations that were forged by World War II, for example. President Kennedy was a young president, was a young congressman, was a young uh, senator probably moved by the same notions as, as some of these individuals here? That's a fascinating question. So one of the things that I try to get, in, get at in this book is that it's not really as much about age alone as it is about how old you were at a particular moment in time. Ah, so, or some, a particular event that yes, happened, like 9-11. Exactly. So being 22 
in 1957 is a lot different than being 22 in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to create, you know, there, there, there might be some uh, general, like, energy levels and, you know, exuberance or optimism that mm -hmm. might be the same. But your actual political attitudes are heavily shaped by the events of early adulthood. And social scientists have found that things that you experience between the ages of roughly 18 to 26 actually shape your political leanings for decades to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's not actually necessarily that young people are always liberal and older people are always conservative. Because actually, if you look at the elections in the early 1980s, young people were with Ronald Reagan right. in, in, in those elections. So, you know, people make their decisions based on the events at the, the events in the world that were happening at the time that they're coming into political awareness. And that's really what this book is about. It traces, you know, young pe millennials in particular were coming into political awareness during the Bush era, right. the Obama era, and now the Trump era. So this book is about what that means for their politics. And I can vouch for that. I mean, I was, most of my friends were young Alex P. Keatons, like right. the character that Michael J. Fox played yeah, on Family yeah. Ties. They all were like young Reaganites, exactly. essentially. Right. Exactly. Uh, and and many of those people, I don't want to speak for your friends, but but many of those people might have just that that's their attitude today, and it's it it's actually much more rare to change your mind than people think. Yeah. So you you touch on the challenges that the GOP is finding them, the challenge that they're finding in, in attracting younger um, people to join the party, but then you also talk about why millennials are more comfortable with the concept of socialism. Yes. So this is something that's very very relevant, particularly with the presidential election. So you have to think about it this way. The oldest millennials were eight or nine when the Berlin Wall fell. So they did not have the context of the Cold War. They ne were never scared of the Soviet Union in the way that their parents or grandparents might have been. They weren't taught that creeping socialism was a threat to American freedom. Instead, many of them uh, saw some of the worst moments of their lives came from the financial crisis, mm -hmm. which many of them thought was created actually by unchecked capitalism and greedy bankers and corporate interests, not the threat of socialism and communism. I also think it's important to note, it's not, it's just not true that all millennials are card-carrying socialists. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Socialists of America has, you know, radically, uh, they have a lot more members than they did five or 10 years ago, partly thanks to Bernie Sanders, but it's still only about 35,000 people and that can fit inside Fenway Park. So it's not really mm -hmm. that every millennial is like a self-identified self comrade to the cause, mm -hmm. it's just more that a lot that the term has lost its sting and it doesn't seem to have such a negative connotation anymore. All right. Really Sounds fascinating. Good. Uh, Charlotte, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for Charlotte. having me on. Uh, the book is called The Ones We've Been Waiting For, How a New Generation of Leaders Will Transform America. It is available on all major reading platforms.